So hello everyone, uh, welcome to this webinar, which is all about different types of geophysics that we can carry out in boreholes. Uh, just before we begin, uh, just to note that the webinar will be recorded and it will be made available to you after the session. And if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box and we will answer these at the end. Uh, just to introduce myself, my name is Harry Higgs. I'm an application engineer here at Guideline Geo. I have a background as an applied near surface geophysicist in the engineering and ground investigation sector in the UK. And I joined Guideline Geo in 2021. Hi, my name is Jana Gustafsson and I work as an application specialist at Guideline Geo. I have been working with GPR uh, the last uh, 20 years or so uh, with many different types of applications, reaching from rebars to bedrock to ice and, of course, measurement also in boreholes. Uh, before we begin, uh, we just have a, a word about the company. So Guideline Geo, design, manufacture, ground penetrating radar instruments under the Marla brand and seismic resistivity and transient electromagnetic instruments under the ABEM brand. The company has a global reach through both local offices and a network of distributors covering more than 80 countries. There are 90 employees worldwide working together with our distributors and other partners to service our customers. Here's a location map showing our offices. Our uh, manufacturing is based in Malo in northern Sweden. Our product development is centered in nearby Umeå, and our head office is in Stockholm. I am based near to Manchester in the United Kingdom, and Jana is based in Stockholm. So ABEM as a company was founded in 1923. Marla was founded some 14 years later in 1937, and here is a list of some of the GPR, resistivity, seismic, and most recently TEM products released over the years. In 2013, Marla and ABEM were brought together under the guideline geo banner, but maintained the individual branding of both Marla and ABEM. So as an overview for today's uh, webinar, we will begin with a brief introduction, then we will focus on a few applications in more detail, namely seismic and GPR. So firstly, what is borehole geophysics? Borehole geophysics is the science of recording and analyzing measurements of physical properties made in wells or test holes. Probes that measure different properties are lowered into the borehole to collect continuous or point data, which is graphically displayed as a geophysical log. Borehole geophysics is used in groundwater and environmental investigations to obtain information on well construction, rock lithology and fractures, permeability, porosity and water quality. In ground engineering, these methods can be used for structural evaluations as well. Geophysical logging systems consist of probes, cables, power control units, and data recording units. So what are common geophysical logs? Geophysical logs encompass a significant number of methods, each designed to measure different physical properties of the borehole and the surrounding ground. As you can see, this is a long list. And we will begin by looking at seismic or borehole testing. So seismic methods are commonly used for calculating primary and shear wave velocities for geological and geotechnical structural evaluations. Tests may be taken in single boreholes where the source is typically at the surface. These tests are called downhole measurements. Alternatively, multiple boreholes may be used with the source located inside one of the boreholes and the receivers in adjacent boreholes. These types of tests are called cross borehole or cross hole tests. Typically, boreholes for these types of tests contain a liner 
which is then grouted to ensure that no air pockets exist between the liner and the wall of the borehole. In general, air-filled boreholes are preferable to test with, as this avoids noise caused by seismic waves being transmitted through the water column. However, this is not essential and it's not always practicable either. Uh, in terms of uh, equipment, uh, a common key wave source or primary wave source for downhole measurements is simply a polyurethane or metal strike plate coupled with a sledgehammer. Shear waves are often generated using a shear beam, and this comprises a wooden beam, often with the ends encased in metal and veins or rods in the bottom to prevent sliding when struck. Alternatively, it is often possible to drive a vehicle onto the beam to prevent movement. For downhole measurements, the source is usually positioned close to the borehole, around one to three meters or three to 10 feet. Borehole sources are available for cross borehole measurements. These devices generate primary and secondary waves, usually through mechanical impact against the wall of the borehole or by discharging energy through electrodes, which in turn vaporize water creating bubbles which expand and collapse, generating high-frequency seismic waves. Receivers are typically comprised of a series of geophones arranged vertically and horizontally to detect both P and S waves. These are housed in a cylindrical watertight casing, which can be inserted and lowered into a borehole. Once lowered to the required depth, an inflatable bladder or clamp can be used to anchor the receivers to the liner or the borehole wall. And then a multi-channel seismograph is used to record the signal measured by each of the receivers. Typically, the sources and receivers shown here are suited for investigation depths of up to 100 meters. So when we undertake downhole seismic testing, the purpose is most often for velocity calculations, which can then be interpreted for geology and physical rock properties. Downhole measurements for velocity calculations can be made using a single set of receivers or by having two sets of receivers at a fixed offset. Using two sets of receivers is the preferred method for projects where the highest accuracy is critical. In this example, the aim of the survey was to determine interval velocities and elastic properties within a borehole located at the site of a power station. For best accuracy, two sets of receivers separated by a fixed one meter offset were used. These were then lowered into the borehole at one meter increments. Each time the receivers were lowered and clamped into place, E waves were generated from the surface using a hammer and strike plate and S waves were generated using a shear beam. The seismic records shown here depict primary and secondary arrivals for two receivers lo located at 14 and 15 meters depth. In this example, the S wave arrivals are 180 degree polarized. And this can be achieved by using both ends of the shear beam and then superimposing the shot records from each. And this allows for more accurate S wave determination. So once data were collected over the full length of the borehole, travel times of first arrivals were extracted using processing software, average velocities and interval velocities were then calculated and graphed as shown here. In this example, data were collected in a clay into siltstone and then sandstone setting with clay down to 23 meters above ordnance datum, and then moving from siltstone into sandstone at 18 meters above ordnance datum. These, these calculated velocities were then related to elastic constants using simple equations. These results are then used by designers to predict soil behavior under various states of pressure and dynamic loading. And note that in special cases where ground conditions may be anisotropic, the test method can in some cases be adjusted. And for a more detailed explanation of this method, you can see the ASTM uh, D7400 article. 
Another use for downhole seismic is pile length determination. For this type of survey, a bowl hole is located adjacent to the pile. Receivers are lowered incrementally down the borehole. P waves are transmitted from the surface by striking the top of the pile, and the seismic profile is built up along the full length of the borehole. As the receivers pass the base of the pile, the seismic waves must travel increasingly through the surrounding geology, which causes a change to the travel times, which is then interpreted for the base of the pile. It is important to note that boreholes must extend some distance beyond the anticipated depth of the pile for this type of test to work. In the example shown opposite, a series of seismic traces are shown at depth increments of one meter. Near the top of the pile, there is a low velocity denoted with the blue line and associated with the direct wave from the source to the receivers. This wave is then overtaken as the first arrival by the faster refracted wave, which travels down the pile, which is then shown with the orange line. And then finally, once the receivers pass the base of the pile, the velocity slows and the green line approximates the velocity of the wave through the surrounding geology. The point where the slope changes is then interpreted for the base of the pile. And this example here is a more typical example. Uh, the previous example was located some distance away from the pile, or should I say the borehole was some distance away from the pile. Um, this one is a much closer offset. So uh, what we see here are just two slopes um, denoted with orange and green lines, each relating to distinct apparent velocities, the orange from the pile, and the green line from the material below the pile. And then corrections can be made for more accurate depth of pile determinations. For example, shown here, the following method by Wang and Liu is used to correct depth by accounting for distance between the pile and the borehole and accounting for velocity. So when the borehole is closer to the pile, the necessary corrections are smaller. And so it is best practice to place the borehole within one or two meters of the pile wherever possible. And then one more example. So in the UK, <coughs> it's not an altogether uncommon example where designers may wish to modify, or in this case, reuse a foundation shared by existing infrastructure. But in the planning process, designers may find that the as-built plans are either incomplete or unreliable. So in this project, we wanted to find out the depth of the pile and also the diameter of the pile at the base so that the designers could calculate the load-bearing capacity of the foundations. In this case, the diameter of the upper section of the pile was known. Uh, the pile diameter was expected to increase towards the bottom, but by an unknown amount. So to establish this information, downhole seismic was used to determine velocity of the surrounding geology and parallel seismic to give the depth to the base of the pile. And then crosshole seismic was used for the assessment of changes to pile diameter and confirmation of pile depth. The crosshole method undertaken was to use a downhole P wave source lowered at fixed increments of half a meter in sync with a receiver located in a borehole on the opposing side of the pile, as shown in the diagram. Each borehole was 20 meters deep, and the data collection process for this project was taking two days to complete. And in this case, the crosshole data shows a gradual reduction in travel time with depth, which is interpreted to be associated with the increasing diameter of the pile towards its base, once taking into account the known velocities of the geology uh, uh, within the boreholes. So in this case, the surrounding geology is clay. Uh, so the ratio of velocity to concrete to clay 
in this case is around three to two. And once the cross all measurements pass the base of the pile at uh, 11.7 meters, the travel times then increase. And this is interpreted as first arrivals from the direct waves traveling through the surrounding geology rather than through the faster concrete of the pile itself. And then using the measured velocities of the materials present and data modeling, it was then possible to determine an increase in diameter from the changes in the travel time data. Uh, so now I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Jana, to continue. Thank you. Okay. So let's start with ground penetrating radar, uh, GPR, ground penetrating radar. Uh, GPR investigation in boreholes is more or less the same as on the ground. You use the same type of control unit, but with the thin pole-like waterproof antennas instead. Uh, measurements are triggered by wheel as on the ground, and both antennas, the TX and RX, are lowered continuously into one or two boreholes. Uh, you need a tripod with a wheel uh, to make the lowering smooth uh, and data collection is made with a monitor or a PC. Uh, when working in boreholes, it is of course always important to remember the quality of the borehole uh, so you don't get stuck with your logging equipment and this is um, important actually for shallow holes as for boreholes that are up to several thousand meters. Um, uh, so you don't want to get stuck. So always keep track of the, the, the quality of the borehole. Uh, but for GPR, you also need to remember that measurement cannot be made through metal casing, uh, but plastic and PVC casing works fine. Uh, and if you have water in the borehole, the conductivity should not be too high, uh, like 10 to 20 millisiemens or more. Because if the conductivity is higher, these uh, electromagnetic radar waves have a really hard time to penetrate the surrounding geology and you don't get any information back from the surrounding of the borehole. Uh, and finally, borehole GPR measurements are omnidirectional. Uh, this means that uh, the electromagnetic waves are emitted in 360 degrees around the borehole, so in any direction. And of course, the reflections are also coming back from uh, 360 degrees. Uh, GPR in boreholes can be made in different types of modes, where the most common one is the reflection mode. In reflection mode, also called dipole measurements, the radar transmitter and receiver probes are lowered into the same borehole with a fixed distance between the TX and RX as an ordinary 2D ground measurement where you pull the antenna behind you. Um, as said, borehole antennas are so-called dipole antennas. They radiate and receive reflected signals from a 360 degree space. And by that, it's really important to remember that the resulting radar gram is actually a composite of all these 360 degrees. So imagine that you have 360 radar grams from uh, around the borehole, and then you just put them together and uh, have one resulting radar gram. Uh, so with this set up, you can determine the distance uh, to the reflector or a point object from the borehole and out. Um, and uh, if you have a plane you are looking for, you can also decide the ang angle between the reflector and the borehole. But it is impossible to say anything about the azimuth, the direction to that uh, reflector, uh, if you are using data from only one borehole uh, with these types of measurements. Uh, reflection mode is most often used to map distance and angle to fractures, cavities, boulders, and uh, maybe other boreholes or tunnels that are missing in the surrounding. The next way to measure is in cross-hole mode or tomography, 
tomographical measurements. Uh, in cross-hole mode, the transmitter and receiver antennas are lowered into different pole holes, uh, so the plane between the pole, pole holes is investigating by acquiring radar transmission along multiple ray paths across this plane. So you have two bore holes and investigate the area in between. Uh, then you use a tomographical inversion to uh, make a, um, yeah, the resulting plot uh, for both amplitude and the travel time of the first arrival. Um, <clears throat> travel time tomography can indicate higher water content in the me media, for instance, water field fractures or cavities because the velocity of the radar signal is strongly affected by the high dielect dielectric constant of water. Uh, and again, amplitude tomography is used to determine attenuation of the radar signal and can be used to map the present and distribution of, for instance, different types of contaminants. And finally, we have the third measurement mode, the surface to borehole mode. Uh, in surface to borehole mode, one borehole antenna is placed on the surface and positioned at different distances from the borehole, and the other borehole antenna is lowered into the borehole itself. Uh, so also with this method, it is possible to compile amplitude and velocity tomographic images of the plane between the borehole and the surface antenna positions. And you can create planes uh, like this in a different direction, depending on where you put your surface antenna. So you have the borehole and then you can place the surface antenna in different direction, directions around the borehole to get the plane uh, actually with a direction. So these were the three different modes of GPR investigations in boreholes. So let's look at some examples. Uh, this, this one is uh, uh, the common reflection mode. Uh, so what we see on the right hand side is uh, two radiograms. Remember, it's a composite of all 360 uh, degrees we are looking for. Um, and we have two radiograms, one measured with a 250 antenna and one with a 100 megahertz antenna. And all uh, the letters of the alphabet actually uh, represent uh, interpreted free, uh, fractures uh, around this uh, borehole. Uh, so with the 250 antenna, we see uh, small fractures close to the borehole, quite nice. And with the 100 megahertz antenna, we see uh, uh, features further away from the borehole. So it, it can be good to, to use... Uh, two frequencies when you are investigating uh, the bedrock to see both the small thin ones and the larger structures further away from the borehole. Uh, with this type of reflection mode, you can actually also plot the amplitude of the first arrival against the depth, uh, which is an indicator of uh, water inflow. Uh, the amplitude variation along the borehole indicates uh, changes of the electrical conductivity of the material we are passing by. So a decrease in amplitude may indicate fracture zones, clay or rock volumes with increased water content. So this is also a nice feature you can pick out from your uh, radar data. Um, <clears throat> borehole measurements can, of course, also be done horizontally. You don't need to have a, a borehole straight down. You can also measure in this direction. Um, in this case, it was a uh, tunnel that was constructed in a really, really fractured rock. So they had uh, huge problems with the water inflow. Uh, so to get a heads up on these fractures, borehole GPR was used in front of the tunnel machine. Uh, so the water inflow from this small hole needed for the GPR was, of course, easier to handle um, than to do the big tunnel from start. Um, and the GPR could reveal uh, the locations of the major fractures beforehand to give the tunneling machine guidance to stop in time and take measures for larger water inflow. 
And, and then we have uh, the final example. Uh, it's about dam inspection. Uh, it's a tomographical investigation of an earth dam. Uh, this dam was in, investigated, uh, inspected with borehole radar in order to determine whether water seepage was occurring through the structure or not, and also where the seepage actually, uh, if if it was present, where could we expect it to be the largest. Uh, so since changes in moisture content have uh, a strong effect on the radar signal velocity, uh, you can use the tomographical way to measure uh, to obtain the velocity information across different planes between different boreholes in this construction. Uh, so the figure on the right hand side is the resulting velocity tomogram uh, and that was uh, made by acquiring borehole radar data between different wells in this, this earth dam. So you have used a measurement between well uh, two and one and then between one and three and made a uh, complete picture of of that area uh, and each color represents a specified velocity uh, the highest velocities are red the lowest velocities are blue and orange and yellow are intermediate velocities and since the radar signal velocity is inversely proportional to the moisture content the lowest velocities, of course, represent the zones uh, of highest water saturation. So uh, we can see in blue um, a really nice picture of uh, the major seepage through this uh, earth dam. So then you get an indication of where you actually need to go and do some maintenance in, uh, in this dam construction. Um, yes, and... This was actually all. It was a short webinar today. Um, but as you can see, borehole in investigations are and can be helpful for many different applications. Um, and borehole geophysics is a really broad application with uh, a number of different uh, uh, geophysical methods you can use. Um, and we have only looked at a tiny, tiny part today. But hopefully you have been inspired to see uh, the benefits uh, for further use and got some ideas of uh, investigations. Um, so thank you for listening. And if you have any question, please uh, share them with us in the, in the chat. Uh, and otherwise, you can always con contact us uh, by email or by phone. Um, our Contacts are also seen on, on Guideline Geo's web page.